Thank you very much. It feels a bit strange speaking English in Sweden, but uh, out of courtesy to the non-Swedish uh, speakers, I decided that I should use English as well uh, this time. And then you don't have to change your mind into another language in the middle of the conference. My first photo is not only to show a photo of myself, but it has a purpose. It's the earliest photo of my youth time interest in aquarium keeping that, that I have. It appeared in a newspaper in Norway in 1975 when I was 16 years old and already then had a kind of a reputation in the local area for being a fish nut. But what really shaped me into what I am and what I do today is probably the experience I had at the age of two or three years when I first looked into my father's aquarium and saw there a world that was so captivating that I very early decided that I had to make a living of working with fish somehow. And I'm not alone in this. I would guess that there's quite a few of the people in the audience here who are now biologists or conservationists or whatever, who got some of the first interest in nature from aquarium keeping. I have a rather broad topic today, and going through it all in, in such a time, a short time, is, is difficult. So, there's lots of thing I, things I would like to dwell on, which I simply don't have the time for. But I hope I can give you a feeling of what aquarium keeping through the ages has been and where we now are going. And to go to the beginning, we have to go as far back as to the old Egyptians. It's commonly thought that in ancient times, people only thought of animals as food. But we know that is not true. Particularly in Egypt, there was a huge interest in the varieties of animals and plants, and not least in fishes. In old uh, stone carvings in, in Egypt, you can find very accurate depictions of practically every single species of fish that ever was found in, in Egypt and neighboring countries. And what's more, we have evidence that they also looked on fish as something that was decorative, that's something that was nice to have in a garden, like this wall painting from the tomb of Nebamum in, in Thebes from 1,400 years before our time. We also know that the Romans had a big passion for fish. A lot of Roman gardens had fish ponds. This particular one is uh, located in Pompeii. It's one of many gardens full of fish ponds. Some archaeologists argue that they only had them as a food source, but I simply don't believe that. And we have plenty of, of written sources telling about the passion that wealthy Romans felt for the fish. Particularly moray eels, where some writers describe how the favorite morays were adorned with jewels. I, I still don't know how they fixed jewels on fish, but somehow they did it. And it is, was a symbol of high status to have magnificent eels to show to your visitors and friends. But now we are getting to the part of fish keeping history, which everyone more or less know. And that's what started in Asia, specifically in China, with the discovery of some more or less golden 
specimens of Carassius avaratus. Well, frankly, we know today not exactly what species this is. Uh, Linnaeus gave it the name Carassius avaratus, but that in principle only applies to the golden variety and what we recognize as goldfish today. The, the exact origin is disputed today. But it was the start of moving fish from garden ponds into vessels that could be held indoors. And that's where we are getting closer to, to modern aquarium keeping. In 1611, the first ship of goldfish came to uh, Lisbon in Portugal. And by uh, 1665, we know, according to the uh, naval officer Samuel Pipps, that goldfish undoubtedly had arrived in England. He describes how he, by visiting his friend Lady Penn, saw for the first time these foreign fishes that were kept in a glass of water and that would live so forever. He was clearly not an aquarist. <laughs> but by 1784, keeping goldfish in the United Kingdom was so common that uh, even the book on sport angling by Walton and Cotton, the complete angler, says it's now a very common practice to keep gold and silver fish in a large glass vessel like a punch bowl. Animal welfare wise, we know today of course that this was not necessarily the best way to keep goldfish, but it started the big interest in fish keeping that a hundred years, or less than a hundred years later, really exploded in England. This explosion in aquarium interest started, as far as we know, with this lady, Anna Constantia Thin. She was married to the sub-dean of Westminster Abbey in London and actually lived in the cloisters of Westminster Abbey. And she had nothing else to do in her time with all the servants surrounding her than to engage in hobbies. And one of these hobbies was collecting animals in English waters and try to keep them alive at home. And she did so very successfully. She describes vividly in her diary how she had her servants emptying water from the aquarium over in a bowl and back to the aquarium to uh, oxygenize it. She had understood that if the water was staying still for too long, the animals wouldn't live. And out of lack of professional pumps and filtration, you used a servant. <laughs> Around the same time, Robert Warrington, uh, who is actually mostly famous for his work in beer brewing uh, was also experimented, uh, experimenting with aquaria. And uh, in 1850, he presented a paper to the Chemical Society of London, uh, the notice of observations on the adjustment of the relations between the animal and vegetable kingdoms by which the vital functions of both are permanently maintained. That wasn't the shortest article uh, uh, title I've read, but it describes very well what he has been doing. He had discovered that fishes that lived in a tank with nothing but fish had a tendency to die. But then when he added plants, they lived much longer. He added Valesneria. But also then, things started to deteriorate. And then he thought of, well, I, I add one more element, and he added snails. And then he more or less concluded that now they will live so forever, because now we have a stable system. These were the two really first people who engaged in what I would call modern aquarium keeping. But the man who took all the honor for it was this guy, Philip Henry Goss. He was a priest, a reverend, 
and had a lot of contacts. He was a close friend of Charles Darwin, for instance. And he visited all these people who experimented with aquarium keeping. And he also did experiments himself. And in 1854, he published the very first book on aquarium keeping ever. The Aquarium and Unwheeling of the Wonders of the Deep Sea. Quite an exaggeration because all the animals he describes in this book are collected near shore uh, on the Devonshire coastline. But it was a very good description on how to keep marine native species in an aquarium and have them survive. And Goss was also the very first to use the word aquarium. He actually said that the old way of describing these fish tanks as aqua vivaria was far too complicated. So he suggested that we adopt the word aquarium. And so it was. Everyone followed. And since then, everyone knows what an aquarium is, even those who never have kept one. And it didn't take long, it actually took less than four years before the first aquarium shop in the world started near Regent's Park in London. And uh, in uh, 1857, the very first aquarium book in Germany was published. In 1861, the very first aquarium book in Sweden was published. Sweden was extremely early with aquarium literature. And it developed into what later has been described as the Victorian aquarium craze. In the Victorian era, if you had any importance in society, you had to have an aquarium. It got to the point where even educational books for young girls telling them how to be a good housewife had specific chapters on aquarium keeping, because you couldn't possibly be a good housewife without maintaining an aquarium. <laughs> but, but at this stage, everyone kept native fishes plus goldfish. But of course there were opportunities. Britain was a big seafaring nation. And over the end of the 1800s, people started to ask people they knew who were sailing on ships, couldn't you bring something nice and exotic with you that I can keep in an aquarium? And they did so. Here's a very wonderful illustration from the Swedish aquarium magazine Aquariet in 1929, it's a bit later, but that shows a bit how seafarers may have been hunting for fish. This is Captain Boutin hunting Guppy and Posilia vivipara in, South American, uh, in a South American dike. It's not quite the same way of hunting that modern aquarists do when they travel to South America, but they did their best to find something that could be kept in an aquarium. And if you look at where people were sailing at that time, this is actually a bit earlier. But I, I couldn't find a, a map with uh, sea routes from, from the Victorian time, but I don't think they had changed a lot. We see that they visited North America, of course. They visited Africa, South America, India, uh, the Far East, uh, China, and Australia, at least the eastern part of Australia. And it's no surprise that the way fishes from the, all over the world started to come to Europe is very closely linked to where these ships were going. I have gone through one of the best sources of when fishes started to appear in Europe in aquarium keeping, Arnold. 1949, and you will see there that it's, it's very evident that the first big imports came from North America, and then South America followed very quickly, 
and South Asia, that is the Indian region. And the others exploded in importance as we came up in the 1900s. While North America has never become really important, we have more or less the same species recognized in the 1950s as we had around 1900. And that's of course because cold water fish never really took off as an interest. People want the strong, vivid colors of the tropics. Going to transport and logistics. Well, first, if we look more closely as to how many species have been known through the ages, we saw that, can see that in 1880 there were only three species of exotic fishes known in Europe. That was the goldfish, it was uh, the uh, par uh, paradise uh, macropod, Macropodus opacularis, and it was better splendens. Those were the three very first. But it escalated. And in 2010, when I participated in an overview together with Alex Berg and Roberto Hensen, we figured out that there was at that time 5,325 species of freshwater fish known in the aquarium trade and hobby. So it's quite a, a, a development over time. I think that the biggest justification for keeping aquaria is exactly the same thing that happened to me. That kids can look into an, a, wor a world that they otherwise wouldn't know and feel a connection to something that brings forward a passion for this life that very few humans know. I would guess that if there were no aquarists, there would be considerably less interest in conservation of aquatic biotopes. And I think I have a couple of examples to prove that. But even the people who keep aquaria frequently disregard how dependent they are on a whole chain of people and processes. The hobbyist is strongly linked not only to the shop where he buys his fish or the wholesaler and importer of fishes, but also to the people who actually catch the fish or breed them somewhere in the world. They all depend on each other. And as we heard in, in Scott Dowd's talk this morning, it's also, aquarium keeping also gives livelihoods, sometimes livelihoods in areas where there are very few alternatives. Fishes are transported today globally by airplanes. That was the big revolution in bringing fish to the markets. And in 2012, which is the latest year where we have uh, FAO statistics on, on the trade, it was exported fish globally for the ornamental fish industry for a total of 342 million American dollars. Exactly how many fish specimens that is, we don't know as it, it, there are no specimens mentioned in the statistics, but I would guess it to be around 1 billion specimens of fish being transported internationally per year for hobbyists worldwide. The 10 largest exporters, I will not spend time on going into details on this, but you will see that Singapore continues to be a very strong part of, of the worldwide exports. Uh, but the growth in other areas, like in the Czech Republic, in Malaysia, Japan, Indonesia, Thailand, has exploded compared to the very minor growth in Singapore. So, in total, in percentage, the exports from Singapore is going down, but in volume, it's still increasing. 
This is a strange thing. Spain always comes up high in exports in the late last 10, 15 years, but that's a, undoubtedly a reporting mistake from Spanish authorities, as there are no aquarium fish exporters in Spain. <laughs> if you look at the big exporters in the world, Singapore alone has around 18.6%. And the second largest is of, of those who really export fish is Japan. The re all the others here are Asian and the rest of the world altogether uh, accounts for about 55%. In addition, there are some countries who produce a lot of fish but don't export. The USA is one good example that they have an enormous production of fish in Florida only for the domestic market. And China is possibly the largest producer of ornamental fish in the world today, but they also export practically nothing. The global exports are growing. There's, there are ups and downs. There have always been ups and downs. And at the moment, many people in the ornamental fish trade feels that the market is going down. I don't think that's the case. The statistics shows that it's not the case. But the market is probably shifting. I think that it's true that the market is going down in Europe and probably in North America, but there's an explosion in aquarium interest in other parts of the world, like India, Sri Lanka, China, and probably also in South America. There's much more interest in keeping fishes in Brazil now than there ever was, and that opens up for new interesting scenarios with the introduction of alien species. Largest importers, I, I will not spend time on that as I see it, uh, the time is running. But I will say a little bit of where the fish come from. In the freshwater section, which is the big part of the industry, uh, we can safely say that 95% or more is captive bred. And then practically only captive bred ex situ in countries far away from the range states. In marines, the majority still comes from the sea, but the number of captive bred marine fishes is also growing at a very high pace. Uh, Nemo and the clone fishes have been mentioned earlier today, and uh, it's seems safe to assume that 90% of the clone fishes sold worldwide today are captive bred. And that has happened in only 20 years. It has gone from zero to 90% to captive bred. And this is not without problems. We have already heard about the Nagoya Protocol and we have heard about uh, native people losing their income. Uh, I'm a bit concerned about uh, sustainable or possibly sustainable marine fish harvest being taken over by captive breeding in non-range countries. Uh, this should be possible to develop this side of the aquarium industry also with more focus on sustainable hand catching. The problem is if there is an economic interest in doing it. And I still wonder why people think it's so terrible to see a group of healthy, vital, living coral reef fishes in a shop. And they say, oh, we are emptying the seas. But if they go to Harrods in London and buy coral reef fishes from the fish department, they don't have the same thoughts. But after all, whether you eat the fish or whether you keep it in an aquarium, for the ecosystem, it has no matter. Ecologically seen, it's dead no matter what you do. When you remove it from the biotope, and if you want to keep it alive and care for it, I can't see that as worse than killing it and eat it. And if you look at the numbers, the annual catches of marine fishes in the world, 
For human consumption, we fish out of the seas globally more than 100 million tons per year. That's a big fish. And they have a bycatch in this food fishery, which is trashed, thrown out because it has no food value of around 17 million tons per year. That's also a substantial number of fish in scale about that size that you saw coming in. And when you look at the marine side, if, if we overestimate, if we estimate the numbers as high as we can, we could say that aquarium fish collection worldwide in seas are less than 100 tons, not 100 million tons, but 100 tons per year. And that's a tiny fish, you can not even see it there. So why does the ornamental fish trade get so much focus and so much criticism? For instance, for, for, for fishing with cyanide. It's terrible because it's, it's not good for the ecosystem and it's even worse for the aquarist to buy a fish who is most likely going to die. But cyanide is used for all these fisheries in the countries that use cyanide. And whether they empty a barrel of cyanide into the sea to take the dead fish floating up, or they swim around with a small squeeze bottle and try to stun the fishes that they have to catch alive. I don't think the one is so much, the, the, the fishing for ornamental fish is so much worse than the other, but everyone focuses on the ornamental fish. We are all to blame. We tell people that we have beautiful fish that deserves to live, and therefore it's bad that we take them. Going to the people who make a living on this. Taking fishes from the wild is controversial, whether it's freshwater and marine. And I will, I will now focus on freshwater because that's where the big thing is. I pass over Hinkus Piccolo, the red tailed shark or red tailed labeo, is probably, according to IUCN Red List, extinct in the wild. And they used to blame the aquarium industry. And they used to blame the aquarium industry with specific reference to one paper. I had to tell them that they hadn't read the paper because the paper actually says that the aquarium industry is not likely to have caused extinction, but it's rather because of habitat loss. The fish was already captive bred in thousands long before it became extinct in the wild. And it's still alive in the aquarium industry and they sell, sell hundreds of thousands per year. And this text you see now is actually what today stays uh, on the IUCN Red List page. That means that the only example someone thought they had of a fish being killed by the aquarium trade is now rectified. It wasn't killed by the aquarium trade. I'm not saying that the aquarium trade may not have had any impact, but it's the difference between an economical extinction and a biological extinction. And when the economical extinction occurs, it means it's so expensive to catch the last fishes that you start to breed instead. And that's what the ornamental fish industry is doing. And they are doing it, for instance, with all the fishes you see in this photo. They are all very uh, high profile species in the trade and they are very much discussed in conservation uh, context. I will give you one specific example which is very close to my heart because I travel a lot in India and have particularly a lot of contact with the Cochin University of Science and Technology in, in, in Kerala. And uh, that's where I started to have an interest for the fish called Miss Kerala or red line torpedo barb, Sahiadria denisonii. And it's look alike, Sahiadria shalacudensis. Uh, uh, there are very minor differences morphologically between the two species. So for a long time, they were both sold under the same name. 
It's just some minor details in the areas I've pointed out that separates them, plus behavior. So Denisonii is a much better aquarium species than Shellacudiensis, uh, but they are still both in the trade. And uh, since they first appeared in the aquarium trade in 1996, they very rapidly got a lot of attention. It's a beautiful species, and people want to have it in the aquarium, and they paid crazy prices for the first fishes to come out of India. And it didn't take long before it was recognized by IUCN as endangered, both Denisoniae and Shalakudiensis. And there was a lot of science being done on this. One of the first papers that really changed the attitude of the trade was this uh, paper on damsel in distress, where the aquarium industry is blamed for a species going close to extinction. But was it so? Well, before I follow that story, I have to tell you that the same scientists who published the paper you're looking at now was a few years later attacked by animal rights activists for killing a threatened fish themselves in the name of science. Uh, they had been taking out 1,000 specimens for, for research. And that's, of course, terrible if the species really is endangered. What happened is that the trade more or less stopped exporting it. Uh, it what became also extremely difficult to export from, from India. And when I was in India one year ago, one and a half year ago, I visited some 20 shops in Mumbai. And every shop in Mumbai now had this species, and they sold them for a price which is less than the wholesale price was when they could export them. So instead of exporting them, they are now catching a lot more specimens and selling them domestically, because that's legal, that's no problem. And uh, when you go to see the biotopes, uh, the Shalakudiensis comes, as you could imagine, from Shalakudi River. And uh, meet the local people who go around there. Do they look at this as an ornamental fish that they should sell to the ornamental industry? Yes, many do. But most don't. There are very few of the total population who are interested in catching fish for, for ornamental trade. The others catch them for something more basic human. They cook them and eat them. This is a food fish. It's, a, it's something everyone eats, and they have always eaten it. And only when it appeared in the international ornamental fish trade, the scientific world and the conservation world opened their eyes and saw, oh, here's a fish in peril. Today, this, this species continues to be eaten in Kerala. And it's sold in hundreds of thousands all over the world, but they are now captive bred in Indonesia. And they are making new color varieties of it that gets even more money. And the poor people living in the Western Ghats in Kerala doesn't get a cent, except for those that they sell within India. Captive breeding of fishes goes on all over the world in basically these locations. And I will give you just a few examples of how these breeding facilities look by examples from guppy farms. Guppy is a fish that experienced aquarists normally think it's, it's very simple, it's very humble, but it's sold in millions of specimens per year. Here's a fish, guppy farm, guppy only in uh, Sri Lanka. Another, even larger, guppy farm in Sri Lanka. Guppy farm in Singapore. Guppy farm in the Negev desert in Israel. No matter where you go in the areas where fish are produced, there will always be someone producing guppy as it's a bread and butter fish in the industry. And they are increasingly professional in handling all the issues surrounding this. Uh, all the export of these fishes is something that 
they put a lot of research into to make sure that once they have gone on the long flight tour, they arrive in good health. We have some challenges facing us in the coming century. It has been a lot of talks over why is aquarium keeping fading away in the minds of, of the young children of today. Is it because they are focused on internet games and iPods and uh, all kinds of technological devices? Or are there other things behind? I think it's a complicated issue, but I think a very big reason is all the negative talk about keeping animals in captivity. And this is going everywhere where animals are being discussed. There is always a big fraction of people talking against animal keeping. CITES, where these photos are from, has more or less been hijacked by animal rights activists who want a ban on every single species in the world. They want to put everything on CITES, whether it's threatened or not because it's an effective way of reducing the trade. You all probably know CITES, so I will not go into detail on it, but point out that it's basically a convention regulating trade and not a conservation uh, tool. It's more trade than conservation. It's about making sure that, uh, that species that are important for trade continues to be available. Sclerophagus formosus was one of the very first species to go on CITES in 1975, directly on Appendix 1. And, uh, well, in a brief period, the Indonesian population was on Appendix 2, but that was soon changed. And they are now allowed to be traded if they are microchipped and come from certified farms. That's the only example of a CITES listed species that continues to be sold in large numbers. And that's because of the big value of this single species. Here you see uh, the development of trade in this species over the years. And they come mainly from farms in Singapore, Malaysia and Indonesia. From 2000 to 2011, about 1 million specimens were sold, and because this is a high-value species, it's very much money involved. But every single species is micro-shipped uh, and from a certified farm. Now, CITES is talking about stingrays. That may happen that stingrays get on, on CITES, but there is no scientific indication even that they are threatened because of international trade. All the three big export countries, Peru, Brazil and Colombia, have export quotas on stingrays and not one single country export as much as they have quotas for. Colombia, who is really fighting to get freshwater stingrays on CITES, have yearly quotas of 23,900 specimens and on average they export 3,500 per year. So why list them on CITES to regulate trade when you already have an export quota five times higher than the actual trade going on? Another issue emerging, biosecurity, animal health. I'm speeding up a little bit because I've been told so. Uh, but these are issues that the industry is aware of. There's more and more biosecurity in place in fish breeding facilities all over the world. And you heard Scott talking today of veterinarians coming to Bacillos to help also in, in uh, improving the fish health from Rio Negro. But also in these conferences surrounding animal health, like the Callisto conferences that went on for three years in Brussels recently, are dominated by animal rights groups who try to use the arguments to ban all trade in animals. Invasive alien species... Um, why didn't it react? 
You know the water hyacinth, but there are also lots of fishes that are introduced worldwide. Uh, I've looked at fish base and concluded that there were more than 865 species that have been registered, introduced outside the natural distribution area. And 435 of these are known in the ornamental aquatic trade. So we have to be careful. We have examples how bad it can go with uh, the lionfishes, Terus woolitans and Miles, who in 1985 first were discovered outside of the coast of Florida. In 95, it had spread a little bit. 2005, it had spread a lot. 2007, even more. 2009, 2011, 2014. It's not good for an industry to see this without taking reactions. And the ornamental fish industry is taking reactions. Actually, high up in the CBD secretariat, it's recognized that the ornamental fish industry is one of the most proactive industries on the problems with invasive species. And we have to be. There are no other industry moving that many species across the world as what we are. Animal welfare, the well-being of animals, it refers to the state of the animal, how it's treated and uh, how we can assure that it's living a good life in captivity. But the future of the aquarium hobby and trade does not be, depend on us being kind to animals. It depends on how the people in general react to the propaganda from people who want to ban all keeping of animals for whatever purpose. And PETA is very high up in this as one of the animal rights organizations that has openly said that they will ban aquarium keeping. Fish in tanks, no thanks. The founder of PETA, Ingrid Newkirk, has in an interview told that one day we would like an end to pet shops and the breeding of animals. Dogs would pursue their natural lives in the wild. They would have full lives, not wasting at home for someone to come home in the evening and pet them and then sit there and watch TV. You could say she's an extremist, but look at the philosophers behind animal rights. The serious professors at universities like Tom Reagan, one of the founding fathers of modern animal rights philosophy. In a perfect world, we would not keep animals for our benefit, including pets. Or Gary Francione, who is also one of the gurus of animal rights thoughts. Even if we could guarantee that all dogs would have homes as loving as the one that we provide, we would not hesitate for a second to bring the whole institution of pet ownership to an end. In Europe, Many of these animal rights groups have organized under the umbrella uh, Eurogroup for Animals, which before the European elections, Parliament elections in 2014, started a campaign saying putting animal welfare at the heart. And that's good. Everyone wants better animal welfare. But that's not what Eurogroup for Animals want. Not only. They actually got extremely good responses. 318 candidates to the European Parliament signed an agreement where they pledged to work to reduce the number of species and animals being kept as exotic pets. And if you read the documentation behind Eurogroup for Animals campaign, exotic pets are aquarium fish, reptiles, amphibians, birds and mammals. Everything which is not domesticated. And we have 318 parliament candidates in the EU who have pledged to work to reduce this keeping of animals. Animal rights people use every single argument that they possibly can find against animal keeping. Animal trade is linked to terrorism and to drug trafficking and to zoonosis and to sustainability and animal health and husbandry, etc., etc., etc. We must not be so stupid that we believe this is about animal welfare. It's about ending a way 
of contact between humans and nature, we are seeing a movement building a barrier between humans and animals. I don't think the animal rights organizations care about animal species. For them, it's an individual is an individual, no matter what species. And they do not seem to bother if a species goes extinct, as long as the animals are living a good life until they go extinct. But they love to use the conservation argument as a tool to reduce human interaction with animals. So, to conclude, I've been asked many times, and last when I was in, in India giving a talk, why are you so passionate about this? Do you really love fish that much? No, nope. I love the people who are influenced by fish keeping that much. And I think we cannot afford to lose the connection between animals in this case, fish and humans. A lot of the future of the nature, natural world depends on people having a passion for animals. Thank you. Thank you, Sven. Björn. Medan vi gör i ordning för nästa föredrag. Är det någon som har några frågor till Sven? Kort där. Since you were, were quite busy speaking about animal rights and animal welfare in the last part, which is very important, mm -hmm. I think it would just be very good for everyone to know the difference between animal rights and animal welfare. And I think you can clarify this in just half a minute. Yeah. Well, the, the, the most important difference is that animal rights philosophy uh, exemplified by the philosophers I mentioned, Tom Reagan and Gary Francione, have actually themselves said that animal welfare reforms is not the way forward. It only halts the achievements in getting animal rights. In other words, if they can see more cruelty in the keeping of animal, that's good because then they much easier get their, uh, the, the public on their side. Uh, animal rights is about assigning legal rights to animals. There have already been court cases in Argentina where they have tried, animal rights groups have pushed for giving human rights to orangutans in the uh, Buenos Aires Zoo, so that uh, the zoo would have to release them into the wild as, as uh, non-human animal with rights of its own to have a free life made on its own decision. Uh, and like I said, uh, I don't think they care about what arguments are used against animal keeping. They just want to make sure that there is no contact between humans and animals unless the animal chooses it in, in them itself. No one is allowed to own an animal anymore. And those are of course not uh, uh, compatible with what we are doing. And, 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 and uh, while animal welfare people, the classical ones, normally accept pets, they just want rules to be followed and so on. But, but uh, um, what I mean is animal rights people want us to mix them up. Oh, uh, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. It's how they're using their power uh, politically in the European community. And yep. it's very important for us to always make a difference between them. Yep. It is, and, and in a sense I could have given a full talk on, on animal rights issues but then I had to deviate a lot away from fishes because they haven't worked that much with fishes yet. But they, they are getting there quite quickly. At the moment, it's easier to target reptiles and amphibians in pet keeping, and that's where the focus is now. But 
they will move on to fishes much more than what they already have done. Uh, we have to stop to continue. Swainer here afterwards. Uh, You're all welcome to talk with me yeah. in the breaks. Yeah. Thank you, Swain. Thank you. Thank you.